This episode was sponsored by our patrons, Julie Gray, Jessica Smith, Rachel Kay, Tracy Steeb, Kim Hokinson, Janelise Cannon, Jill Harrigan, Jamie Lang, Maria Sanchez, Valerie Jacobson, Heather McKinnon, Chantel Oliver, Caitlin McTaggart, Tamzane Weir, and Katrina and Kristen. Thank you so much for being our sponsors. We couldn't do it without you. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Katie. Today, our story begins in the Dutch Republic in the charming town of Dordrecht, Mm. which is about 60 miles south of Amsterdam. Okay. In the year 1672. Dordrecht is literally the oldest official town in the Netherlands Mm. because it was at the confluence of, like, all the rivers. So when the Dutch issued their Declaration of Independence in 1572, it was there in Dordrecht. So it was it. The crossroads. Proud. Republican heritage. Never even heard of it. Yeah, me neither. The De Witt family served Dordrecht in the Dutch Republic since the Middle Ages. So they're like, kind of like the Kennedys, but way Hmm. longer. Like (laughs) the family of public service. Uh. (laughs) Now, it's 1672. And anyone familiar with Dutch history has just said to themselves, "Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Because 1672 is known as Rampjaar, which Mm. is the disaster year. Yeah. Two DeWitt brothers, Johan and Cornelius, are the leaders of the Republic, trying desperately to hold it together. They're at war with England, France. They're at war with Cologne and Munster and basically always at war with Spain. (laughs) And by this point, they're losing. People are starving. Mm. Unrest and discontent in the streets. And speaking of the streets, turn away from the main square and down that alley. Do you see that little girl? That's Maria, Hmm. daughter of a bricklayer, scurrying through the streets of Dordrecht. She watches the DeWitts from afar. In her short life, Maria's world has turned hostile. She pins her hopes on these brothers. She's like, keep the faith, guys! Save the Republic! (laughs) That August, the town witnessed something that shook their world. Cornelius DeWitt was arrested on charges of treason. He was hauled away to prison in The Hague and put on trial. (laughs) But his brother Johan's like, don't worry, Dordrecht! (laughs) <laughs> Justice will prevail. I will go visit him in prison and sort this out. Uh-oh. Little Maria's flitting through the streets, listening to all the town chatter, and everybody's just waiting for news, waiting for the glorious return of the DeWitt brothers. And instead, a messenger arrives bearing some pretty dark news. Hmm. While Johan was visiting Cornelius in prison, the warden there sent all the security officers away on a sham errand. Mm. A local militia stormed the prison with a growing mob of starving peasants. The brothers were seized, shot on display, and then their bodies were thrown to the mob. And the mob tore them apart and ate them. Ah. That was not where I expected that sentence Uh to go. (laughs) No one was ever prosecuted for these crimes. Wow. The Rampyard, the disaster year, it even, it basically has its own slogan. So this is a quote from the time. The people were irrational, the government helpless, and the country beyond salvation. (laughs) So now I want to zoom in on this little girl, Maria, hearing the news in the streets of Dordrecht. (laughs) The injustice of it. What is a little girl to do? You know. Nothing. (laughs) She's she's the most irrelevant category of person in the Netherlands. Right, yeah. But thanks to the dogged research of my guest, Susan Sewer, we get to see what happened next. That little girl would become a lifelong agent of justice. Huh. 
And in fact, she <laughs> will go on to be the warden of a prison. Whoa. What? <laughs> wow. I know. To me, she's a very striking example of that old adage, if you want to change the world, start with yourself. Huh. She set her life on a path. She made it happen. And she changed her little corner of the world. Wow. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. My name is Susan Suer, and I'm head of education at Heritage Leiden. We're going back to Leiden on my accidental visit last summer. Do you remember? Yes. <laughs> You're stranded. Travel chaos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bizarre, long layover. Best mishap I ever had. Yeah. There are worse places to be stranded for three days. Yeah. I, I work in an amazing yeah. city. Yes. <laughs> Leiden is... No, it's, it's not like an open-air museum because mm. it's it's alive. The city is alive. And it changes. But you still feel the 17th and 18th century. In yeah. the city. When I ended up in Leiden, I just did a quick Google search for historical figures mm-hmm. in Leiden. And it was just a list of all men. Yeah. And I thought... That can't be true. There have got to be some. <laughs> so I'm so glad I found you. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are quite some women as well. And isn't that always the way? I mean, it's sad but true. But if you want to find mm-hmm. historical women, then you find female historians today. <laughs> and they will help yep. you out. <laughs> so I found Susan Sewer at Leiden City Archives. Oh, uh, clever. I, I really took quite an effort to find some women and, well, yeah, the, the general public still thinks that women were just taking care of the kids right. in the household. Yeah. Well, the men really didn't earn enough to keep every, everyone alive. So yeah. they really had to work. <laughs> women had to work. So how did she find Maria van Nispen? In tiny fragments, bit by bit. <laughs> Well, uh, about 10 years ago, we got an addition to the archives. It was about the jail in Leiden. It was a registration of uh, the people entering and leaving the jail. And it said, Mijn Sipierster, a female jailer. And they were like, oh, would you look at that? So then uh, my, my colleague, André, he... Uh, went to look in uh, the city archives and he found her name and her name was Maria van Nispe. But I wanted to know more about her. So then I thought, okay, who was she? And I found her marriage certificate to Wingert, her husband. And it said that she lived on the Rapenburg, the canal where the rich people live. And I thought... And she's like, who is this wealthy woman jailer? What is going on? Yeah. So she digs and digs. Her husband is a poor nobody from nowhere. And he runs the jail with her. So what? So I try and find out where did she come from? And how did I meet? And how did I get the job? I found out she uh, was born in Dordrecht, a city a bit to the south of Leiden. Turns out she discovered that she lives on the rich canal because she is a maid for a rich woman <laughs> who lives on the canal. Huh. Her, her father was um, a bricklayer mm. uh, and all her brothers as well. So how do you end up being the jailer in another city yeah. <laughs> around 1700? Yeah. And I'm, I'm still doing the research, but it's so great to find all those uh, tiny yeah. bits of information, little pieces of the puzzle, and then connecting them and trying to fill in the gaps without too much fantasy. Yeah. Do you feel like you are almost bringing her back to life? Like you're finding her from the shadows? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. So now Susan Sewer was in deeper. So this woman wasn't wealthy, 
in fact. She's a bricklayer's daughter from Dordrecht. Hmm. But equally surprising, how did that woman become yeah. a prison warden? Yeah, neither of those are any more feasible. Yeah. <laughs> both of them are weird. Yeah. They're both equally weird. <laughs> this is how it happened. From a five or six year old girl in disaster year, Dordrecht, she grows up. Hmm. She is a maid to a wealthy woman in the rich neighborhood of Leiden. Okay, Netherlands. Netherlands, yeah, right around the year 1700. 1700. Are we in a Vermeer painting? Like, what is she. What's she wearing? What are, yeah. What is she dressed uh, yeah. like? We're pretty much in a Vermeer painting, okay. if you can picture that. They had a long white uh, chemise. They, they slept in it as well, like linen. And over that, they had usually two skirts. They usually had quite big pockets uh, beneath their skirts to uh, stuff everything in, instead mm. of a handbag. And they were usually wearing a white cap. Because you needed to cover your head. By this point, the Dutch Golden Age is behind us. Mm -hmm. And Leiden is a pretty sad, scary place. Hmm. Leiden was quite poor. The economy just collapsed. So you couldn't make a living from just spinning wool. So they uh, pickpockets just to to manage to get enough food to live, uh, live from. So Maria, she's working in the same neighborhood as a charming young man named Wingert. <gasps> it's true love. <laughs> At least, that's the story I'm telling myself. We don't actually have any sources on that. <laughs> Susan Sewer is writing a historical fiction novel about Maria van Nispen. Do you imagine a love match with her husband? Yeah, why not? Um, she didn't have to marry him. She needed a husband, but they knew each other for quite a while. Because they lived so so close together, they must have known each other. Leiden was a very small city uh, anyways. And around 1700, most people married for love. They married in St. Peter's Church that was in the middle of the whole community. So that's what I want to reconstruct. Okay, the most exciting thing is that Susan Sewer very recently, like after I recorded this episode, she found a prenup agreement that they had signed before they got married. Whoa. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. Because Wingert, bless him, he's coming into this marriage with the clothes on his back. Mm -hmm. That's all he's got. And this prenup has a list of all of Maria Van Nispen's possessions. <laughs> Which is a little bit mind-blowing. But she's just a maid. She's not... Exactly. And that's what makes the list so crazy. Hmm. How is this lady constructing such a life? Here, I'm just going to... I'm going to read it all to give you the idea hmm. of what her property is at this point when she's marrying a penniless young man with the clothes on his back. Hmm. Okay, so here's her possessions um, according to the document translated by Susan Sewer. She's coming in with 400 guilders. It's a lot of money. Mm. One pair of diamond ear bows. This may be earrings. Earrings, yeah. One pair of gold pins. A golden ring with little pearls. Another golden ring. A golden lock with a bead necklace. All of her silver work, which is worth 50 guilders. A silver signet thimble. A pair of buckles. A silver crochet needle. Two long black skirts with two overskirts from Tours, France. Two heavy overskirts and a raincoat, an apron, three skirts, five little capes, four sets of bows, four what? black hoods, two bodices, three vests, seven pairs of woolen and linen stockings, one whole what? roll of linen for undershirts, two bed sheets, six pillowcases, 18 napkins, five towels, six tea towels, 16 undershirts, 15 coifs like the hair cap. And then ten mu muches that goes over the it's the cap. It would the coif is the yeah the the fabric thing that goes under, and then that is probably the piece the structure piece that goes, goes over on the, the top. top. 
14 more aprons, 29 scarves, 10 neck scarves, 50 flat what? sleeves, 18 neck scarves, 14 handkerchiefs, 6 neck scarves with lace, 7 beautiful coats, 2 white hoods, 4 pairs of gloves, 10 paintings, what? 2 chairs, 2 little tables with carved foot stove, 1 oaken chest, 4 baskets, and 1 closet worth 40 guilders and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> What is going on? I know. No. Maids <laughs> maids own two dresses. Yeah. What? 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 I found a will of uh, a rich woman living at Rapenburg. And in that will, she, uh, she, she, she leaves money to Maria van Nispen, who was her maid. Uh, and uh, well, that's quite interesting because you usually don't find maids in the archives. Mm. They're not registered any, anywhere. But in this will, she was mentioned. I bet that moment when you found her in the will was so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was dancing through the reading room, I think, <laughs> and telling everyone, look, I found her. I know what it is. How, how she managed to get from Dordrecht. <laughs> Against all odds, she found Maria van Nispen in the archives <laughs> in this will. What? And the will actually stipulates something kind of amazing. It says that after the mistress dies, Maria van Nispen must be secured in a very good job before this family gives up on her. Wow. So she's set. That's, that's bananas. Yeah. And so when the woman dies, she's looking toward the future. She looks out over the canals of Leiden and says, you know what I've always been really interested in? Justice. I see these wardens out there, and I think I can do better than that. I would like to be the warden of Leiden Prison, which is just around the corner. <laughs> I think Maria was the one who made them get the job after they were married. She got the job. Wow. What? How old is she at this point? She's probably, let's see, they got the job in... Um, they married in 1695, and they started working uh, in the city prison in 1699. So she's like maybe early 30s. Wow. Yeah. And she becomes the warden, and they move in. And she's gonna. She's married being a warden. Yep. She's like, wow. come on, wingert. That's where we will raise our children and live happily ever after. Wow. <laughs> so they move in, and they live on site in this big brick building. <laughs> there's a jail. There's a prison. And they have three or four kids. <laughs> Behind these fortified walls, they <laughs> live happily ever after. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know. Wow. But, uh, and this is where, I mean, this is where it gets really fun to imagine, like kind of fascinating in a city that's just full of poverty and violence, in a country which is on the rapid decline, mm. what does it look like to be warden of a jail and a prison? Mm. And and what does it look like to raise your children there? What What is her life like? Wow. Yeah. The building is still there and the prison cells are still there, but it's now used by the university. Ah. What do they use it for? Offices. Oh, wow. Imagine having an office in a prison cell. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. the cells are quite damp, oh. so most of the cells are used uh, for storage. Actually, when I was wandering the streets of Leiden, I was struck by this particular building. I stopped and stared at it and thought, wow, this amazing building on this random little street you would never know. Little did I know that that was the prison that I was looking at, but I hadn't done the interview yet. I walked past it again afterwards and just marveled. This is where it happened. The jail and the prison were in the same building and she managed both of them. Oh. They had one man working for them and probably a maid. I'm not super familiar with the law in the Netherlands at this time period, but elsewhere in Western Europe, this is life in prison for 
minor offenses often. Yeah. Or yeah. these well, are not serial murderers on the whole. These are No, not really. Yeah, cause those, or, yeah. Yeah, because those people, if you're like murderers, you're just gonna be executed. executed yeah. So yeah. this is you stole you stole a loaf of bread like Sean yes. Valjean. Yes, exactly. And in fact, um, there are a lot of kids. We have children around 12 years old who just stole bread or a cookie. So they they were uh, not in prison, but they were in jail and usually sentenced to flogging. Sure. Everyone was carrying a knife mm. during that time. You needed a knife to eat, to cut your food. So there are lots of knife fights, lots of violence, uh, people cutting off each other's hands by, by accident because they were drunk. But a lot of drunks that are just like thrown in the tank for yep. a week <laughs> and put on a diet of bread and water. Mm. You also have a lot of adulterers. Mm -hmm. Mostly you were banished for that <laughs> for 25 years. Wow. Yeah. Prisoners themselves, you really, you only get snippets in the records, but it's so easy to flesh them out with your imagination. The, the prisoners weren't always uh, behaving uh, well, so I can find them in the judicial archives as mm. well, because they try to escape or uh, throw away their bread. <laughs> so the, the prison life in the 18th century is... Well, quite easy to reconstruct. People shared their cells, and during the day they had to work. Oh. So uh, the man had to grate wood, brassel, hard red brassel wood that was used for paint, and the women spin wool. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So she was managing. She was managing all that. Kind of a workhouse. Yeah, it was like a workhouse. Yeah. Oh. So what is that family dynamic like? Are some prisoners part of their yeah. family? Like, I just really want to know what is their relationship to each other? <sighs> they, were, they were all living together in the same building. The prisoners and the jailer. So if you were... Living for 15 years in the prison, in the workhouse, with the same jailer, mm. then you get some kind of connection. Um, it, it was a small society of people coming and going, and most of them knew each other. Um, I found one person who was sentenced to 30 years in prison. So, he spent most of his life there. Yeah. Um, but it could be shortened if you testified mm. against another criminal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> then you could your your sentence could be shortened. Wow. Um, that happens quite a lot. Mm. Yeah, cool. some people kept returning, like Jan Reindert. Uh, he was also called Cinderella, but then in Dutch. And he uh, got in knife fights and was sentenced to prison. And then he was released, had a fight again, and he was sentenced again to prison. Then he went to Amsterdam, got in some fights, and spent some time in prison over there. Mm -hmm. So kind of fun to imagine each time this Cinderella character comes back, mm. she's like, well, well, right. Cinderella, <laughs> welcome back. It's been a while since you've had a knife fight. <laughs> They just got along with each other. Wow. Well, there, there were pregnancies as well inside the, the prison. So that, that's really strange. And sometimes there were diseases that were contagious and people were just thrown out. They hadn't finished their sentence, but they needed to get rid of them. Plague's going around. Yep. Everybody's <laughs> sentences end early. Bye. Mm. <laughs> we do know what... They got to eat. It was bread and buttermilk in the evenings. And they got peas, lentils and things like that. I think on Sundays they had some meat. She was a highly competent warden. 
And we know that it was her and not her husband because he is always described as chronically ill. Mm. Nobody knows what that means. They never specify. But I can't help but wonder from my from my 21st century perspective, <laughs> what if he's just a house husband? Yeah. What if he just is raising the kids and yeah. staying home and she's the boss and that's the way they like it. And the yeah. only way that you can explain that in the 18th century is to he's, say, oh, he's, he's an invalid. Ill. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's how it is in my mind. Can't prove it, but that's how it is. Hmm. He's a house husband. Or he's a drunk. He could be. I know. That's where I went at first. But, but I don't like I, that. I'm making him a, a sweet little house husband who just primarily takes care of the kids. Yep. I like that. Yeah. We better be clear, though, that we only know little snippets of the whole story. And it mm. could be that the prison was pure hell. It could be. Mm. I mean, there was one time when there was a prison break. So it's it's not like some utopia where prisoners are like, oh, I just love it here. Right. And I'd love to stay here forever. <laughs> like, she's not there to coddle people. She's there to serve justice. Mm. Uh, anyway, that prison break was interesting because it was her husband that was tricked and overpowered. Oh, no. And that's how they escaped. It wasn't her. Mm. <laughs> wow. This is a strong woman. But that doesn't mean she's an elite woman. She's still a bricklayer's daughter. Yeah. I don't think she could write. She could read, but couldn't mm. write. Just her name. So everything has been written for her. Wow. As her husband's health declined, it appeared he was near death. She goes to the city of Leiden and she goes, Okay, you guys know that I've been doing all of it all along. So could we just officially remove him from the contract and have it be just my name? I am the warden mm. at Leiden Prison. Uh, when he dies, not if he dies, when he dies, uh, can I just uh, keep on doing this? And the city is like, yeah, that sounds good. No big <laughs> deal. There's no hullabaloo. There's no, what, what, a woman? You know, no pushback wow. at all. And so I think that's pretty huge because it tells us something significant, not just about her, but about the culture. Yeah. But the city itself is like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, you are the warden. Um, yeah. And actually, Susan Sewer has found examples of other female wardens in other prisons. Hmm. Yeah, there has been at least two female jailers in Leiden in oh. the 17th century. Yeah, I'm especially trying to point out that the, the women uh, had the same jobs as men. So in the novel, I'm picking out other women who have jobs that we usually associate with men's jobs, like mm -hmm. grave digger. Tiling of roofs, really working in building houses. Yeah. It's not an unusual thing. Hmm. Kara Cooney has pointed out, usually we will only hand power off to women when things are already about mm -hmm. to co fall completely apart. That it has to get to that stage of total disaster or chaos before mm -hmm. you hand things to women and then blame mm. them for it not working. But if there's but, multiple... Yeah, women are just doing all kinds of jobs. Yeah, then this just seems like it was not, these were not seen as yeah. gendered jobs in the way that we think about them. Yeah, I compare it to today. I often think about historians in the future who will look back on the 21st century and they'll say, like, let's look at gender roles in the 21st century. Hmm. Um, definitely patriarchy still. Yeah. And definitely, like, you could see the gender patterns and say, this is how society is. Um, but... That would probably be simplifying the reality. Mm. Like, for some reason, one of the examples that comes to mind is every household <laughs> who gets deliveries from Amazon, mm. there's one name on the Amazon packages. Oh. <laughs> and wow, this in our person family's case, so yeah. much stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In our family's case, it's my name. Yeah. But, like, I don't even know where that came from or how that came about. It was so long ago and it's so irrelevant. But... Every package that comes to our house has my name on it. Yeah. And in the future, will people be like, well, 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 look at this. Every package has her name. What a declaration. When really it's it's irrelevant. Like, Yeah. I signed up for the first account and that was it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every individual is ordering stuff. It all has my name on it, but it doesn't really mean anything at all. Yeah. So 
I sometimes wonder if the same thing is true of the past, that there was more gender equality than we see in the records. Mm -hmm. And as far as what Susan Sewer has been uncovering in Leiden history, it seems to be way more like like our gender roles today. Mm -hmm. Women are out there doing everything. And yeah, they don't show up in the records quite as much, but the, the records were just kind of an irrelevant detail yeah. to people who were who were living that experience. Hmm. So if that's the case, then my question is, why did modern society accept the story that women aren't in history because they were all at home making <laughs> bread, you know? I get like, to use my line. We can always blame the Victorians. Yes. I know. In you any know situation, you can uh, always blame the Victorians. Because <laughs> the Victorians, like, they wanted women to do that. So they were like, this is the way that it's always been. Yeah. It was men who thought that was the way it should be and interpreting everything yeah. through that lens. Ugh. And, like, I totally believed it. As an undergrad history major, mm. my mentors certainly taught me that exact thing they were like you know we're not we're not being sexist or just that it's just that women were not allowed to participate yeah. and that's why they're not in the narrative. i totally believed it yeah I totally that was the big it. feminist shift when we were in, in college age from women weren't capable of doing things to it's not their fault they didn't yeah. do anything they were prevented they just were not allowed and that was the big leap of like ah oh, yes well they could have but they weren't allowed yeah and that felt like a big step and then of course the reality is no women have always been doing stuff yeah oh it's so frustrating i mean i won't give you uh all the details but right now in my capacity it, with the heritage foundation of my local history <laughs> i can't believe how many painful battles i have to fight literally with my former mentors mm. about who should be included in our local history narrative Wow. Like that I am still having to say, did you realize that your list is 95% white males and that that's not actually the story? <laughs> and they just go like, ha, 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 ha. these are the important people. You yeah. know? And then the narrative, well, we're just trying to, you're trying to shoehorn women yes. in, tell a narrative that wasn't true. And no, Where they were not there's, relevant. There's yeah. plenty of women who should be there the whole yeah. time. Oh, yeah. I tell you, I just want, I, fighting these battles, it gets old, man. <laughs> it gets old. Anyway, so I, I, stories like this, you're dealing with little scraps of records because records just didn't matter. Like they weren't writing stuff down. It wasn't really a society of writing stuff down. So you have what you have to go off of, but it's enough to show us a completely different view of the past mm. than we think than the Victorians told us <laughs> was really going on. But that's small enough we can ignore it. Yeah. And Bless your heart. Yeah, we'll get there. We will get there. In 1727, after nearly 30 years as warden of Leiden Prison, Maria van Nispen resigned, citing a breast complaint. Oh. A condition of the breast. I don't know if it had anything to do with her lungs or whether maybe she had breast cancer. Hmm. But she didn't feel up to the job anymore. She moved in with her son, though. And if we look at his career and that of his son we see a pretty incredible arc of public service because <laughs> Maria, bricklayer's daughter, she works in public justice. <laughs> she raises her kids in the prison. Managed to get her son into Latin school because he could write. I have found his handwriting. I think he did part of the administration of the, the prison when he was about 12. Because it's uh, oh, it's a school hand, <laughs> really school handwriting. Her son goes on to work in the halls of government. He can read and write. Mm. 
the income's quite high in the, the social ladder. Her grandson goes on to university, Leiden University. Wow. To university. So, so this is a triumph of a family's rise. Hmm. She was buried in St. Peter's Church in the same tomb as her husband, and that church is where they got married. Hmm. That neighborhood was their world. Yeah. Her name isn't on the stone. Um, <sighs> it's just his. Of course. And and their son, who is like way more prominent and important than they are, he too was buried with them and his name isn't on the stone. Mm. So I don't think it mattered. Yeah, it was just name? a matter of, eh, yeah, it's I, not worth the I, money to put him on there. Yeah, I think it's an Amazon delivery type situation <laughs> where like everybody knows the whole family is there. Yeah. But he, but the husband was the first one to die. So it's his name on the huh. stone. Just like I was the first one to sign up for Amazon. And here we are. Yeah. I respect that deeply. <laughs> that these people getting buried in a tomb, they don't even care if their name yeah, is Yeah, this is your dream. Yeah. Totally erased and it. forgotten. <laughs> I feel a connection to her. <laughs> she just did what she could to make her little corner of the world a little bit better. Hmm. While I was researching this episode, I came across this old quote from Osho, which probably most people have heard before. It's really cool to take this Eastern quote and see how this woman in 18th century Leiden just lived it out perfectly. Hmm. So the quote is, there is no need to change the whole world. Just change yourself and you have started to change the world. Hmm. Because you are part of the world. If even a single human being changes, that change will radiate to thousands and thousands of others. Hmm. And those times she lived through were rough. And maybe that's why I'm especially charmed by her story, because I kind of feel like the times we live in today right. are rough. We're living the Irish curse of may you live in interesting times. Yeah, yeah. Because, like, I mean, she lived through culture wars and conflict and anger and scapegoating. And mm -hmm. we have all of that. But then in her times, add on to it actual starvation and, <laughs> you know, wars on your doorstep and gross miscarriages of justice. Yeah. We can see, we can imagine how, what the times she lived through felt like on a daily basis. Mm. And she said, what can I do on the side of justice? And she did that. Even though she was a nobody from nowhere, she just forged her own future. And that did radiate to thousands and thousands of others down through the generations. I think that if you really want something in your life, you can make it happen. Mm. Women can just achieve the same things as men. We all know that, but uh, it's not different now from 200 years ago, 300 years ago. That's, I think, is the, the most important lesson we can learn from her life. Special thanks to Susan Sewer at Leiden Archives, who is halfway through her novel about Maria van Nispen. If you read Dutch, there's more on her website, and Susan Sewer has a podcast where she shares stories that she unearths in the archives. You can find links on our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. Music for this episode was composed and recorded by Doug Maxwell, Jimena Contreras, Sir Cubworth, J.S. Bach, and Excel Music. 
Emmett Fenn, Juanetta Mexel, and Hanu Dixit. And our theme song was composed by Daniel Foster Smith. Our interns are Katie Boucher and Kara Maxwell. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post all kinds of additional content each week. And just a heads up, February 19th is the deadline to register for our France trip. There are five spots left, so get on it if that trip has got your name on it. Thank you so much for donating, and thanks for listening. <laughs>